Good morning, Journey Community Church. Um, thank you for being able to join us in worship this morning. Um, why don't we take a couple moments to just prepare our hearts for worship and thank the Lord that we're still able to worship together in this regard, um, even under these circumstances. So let's just go ahead and take a couple minutes to prepare our hearts for worship. just want to thank you just want to thank you that um, we're still able to worship Lord Father um, that we're still able to worship without persecution Lord Father God um, Lord Father I just ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to us Lord Father as we worship this morning um, even though we're separated geographically, Lord Father, send your Holy Spirit to each one of us so that we may be linked through the Spirit, and that we may be one body through the Spirit. Lord Father, um, I pray all these things in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Clean hands, 
give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another
my heart is overwhelmed And I cannot hear your voice I hold on to what is true Though I cannot see If the storms of life they come And the road ahead gets steep I will lift these hands in faith I will believe I remind myself of all that you've done And the life I have because of your sin Love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me free And I am yours God, I'm forever yours Mountain high or valley low I sing out and remind my soul That I am yours God, I'm forever yours Filled with hope And every promise comes my way When I feel your hands of grace Rest upon me Staying desperate for you, God Staying humble at your feet I will lift these hands in praise I will believe I remind myself of yours say it one more time I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son love came down and rescued me love came down and set me free and I am yours God Forever yours Mountain high or valley low I sing out and remind my soul I am your God I'm forever yours Love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me free And I am yours God I'm forever Mountain high or valley low, I sing out and remind my soul that I am yours, God I'm forever yours. I'm yours, I'm yours forever. I'm yours, I'm yours forever. I am yours, I am forever yours. I'm yours forever. I'm yours, I'm yours forever. I'm yours, I am forever. Love came down. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. God, I'm forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out and remind my soul that I am yours. God, I'm forever yours. Sing it one more time. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. And I am yours. God, I'm forever yours. Mountain high. 
to your Father. Thank you for all that you've done on the cross. Um, thank you for forgiving our sins and our transgressions. Thank you for being with us even when things seem hopeless as we become more dependent on you. And thank you for your daily provision of bread. Lord Father, help us forgive others as you have forgiven us. Help us not fall into sin and help us continue walking in your light as we seek your righteousness and your kingdom here on earth. Lord Father, we love you, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. journey community church so good to see you guys another sunday um, even if it's virtually through a screen maybe if you're in our zoom fellowship call we can wave hi to one another right now or if you're tuning into our um, youtube stream you can hit that fire emoji on our public chat and we can see who you are and um, that you're tuning in and that we can say hi to one another that'll be like our pseudo fellowship welcome time um, so I just wanted to welcome you to our church, to our online service today. Um, happy May. I think um, the turn of a month is really significant, and especially May is a very significant month in the life of our church because there's a lot of transitions. People are moving in and out. Semesters are ending. Um, summer sessions are beginning. People are graduating. Um, so this month of May might look a little bit different, but I am eagerly anticipating to see what God might do in our individual lives and in the life of our church. So um, before I share some announcements with you, let me pray really fast for us. Gracious God, you are so good to us. You are so good that um, even in quarantine, even in self-isolation, we have community. Um, you still provide for our needs. Um, our spiritual needs, our mental needs. Um, God, you are truly the God of provision for us. Um, God, you are um, a communal God. We see that in the fellowship between yourself, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for modeling um, just how much you delight in community and fellowship. And so, God, we take a moment just to be so grateful for the people who... Um, call us shoot us a text to make sure that we're doing okay um, on a week to week on a day to day basis to the people that we're interacting with um, and living with father god we thank you that um, yeah there are people who are willing to give um, us their time and attention and lord would we be generous father god with our own attention with our own um, time to check in on on other people as well um, Heavenly Father, God, we pray um, at this time that you would really bless the words that we share with one another in this service, the words that we will hear, the words that we will share with the people around us um, throughout the rest of the day. Um, God, would they be pleasing to you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So I have a couple quick announcements that I want to share with you guys. First, um, not a new announcement, summer family groups right around the corner starting in mid-May. If you want to sign up for that, if you haven't already, please fill out the Google form on our website or in the description box below. Um, that has been announced before. So if you didn't know that already, you can check out our website for more details about that. Second, our grad night is this upcoming Friday, May 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That Zoom link will be on our website and on our social media links. Um, and if you're in college fellowship, uh, if you're part of our college community, you'll probably get that in an email from your family group leader as well. Um, check that out. That will be just a really precious time where we hear testimonies from our seniors. We get to pray for them. We get to watch silly presentations and um, laugh and be nostalgic. So if you want to join us for our grad night for the class of 2020, that will be this Friday, um, May 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time via Zoom. Also, I just want to remind you that you can always continue giving your tithes and offerings to our church online via Venmo or PayPal. Those links are under the giving tab on our website. Check those links out there. 
Um, before I welcome Pastor Dave to come and deliver the word, um, we've been doing a time of testimony sharing um, at our church, and we call it On My Way because we're just checking in to see where people are on their way in their spiritual journeys, just like we would check in on somebody if they're coming to see us or pick us up, whatever it may be. So today um, we have our sister Christine um, sharing a little bit about what God has been doing in her life at this current time. So would you um, welcome Christine um, with a little bit of applause <laughs> and Christine will come and share um, what God has been doing. Hey guys, um, so if you don't already know me, my name is Christine Gao um, and I'm a rising junior at UNC. Uh, so this week, Caitlin asked me to speak a little bit um, for On My Way, or basically um, just sharing a little bit about how God has been revealing himself to me um, recently. Um, so yeah, I guess this is kind of my testimony. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just start. So since I became a Christian, one of the most difficult things I've had to overcome are my insecurities. Um, so I seriously used to have a really self-degrading sense of humor, uh, which I now realize is just a way to cover up my lack of self-confidence um, and desire to feel valued and accepted. In high school, I had pretty bad anxiety-induced insomnia, and I would lie awake for hours at night, and my brain was just calculating every possible action and consequence that I would have to face the following day. I was pretty reclusive, and I kept my friends um, friends at a distance, close enough to be able to have someone to sit with during lunch, uh, but far enough to minimize the possibilities of getting hurt. Uh, so at the start of my freshman year, I was already well acquainted with this narrative of insecurity is just failure to trust in God. Uh, but it was just really hard to truly believe that the only love I needed was the love of my father. Um, so especially during a phase when first impressions um, could establish relationships for the next four years um, and when I was finally thinking about my identity and shaping my own beliefs and morals. Um, I remember very clearly the first week of school having a breakdown um, and calling my mom um, and she was trying to console me and she said, you're meeting so many people, like why are you so sad? You should be happy. Um, I, but I wasn't. I told her, I said, everyone is so smart and outgoing. They all know who they want to be in life and they're all better Christians than me. Of course, the easy way out would have been to just guard my heart, um, guard my heart against potential hurt and make it me against the world. I attribute my own downfalls as the shortcomings of others. I could just continue being a student, being a part of student orgs, and being a part of a church community on my own terms. Like, it would be a self safe environment that I just built for myself. I was in such a self-absorbed mindset, believing I could just make plans for my future, that it really shook me <laughs> to the core the moment God revealed to me that my life is not my own. Um, my life is so fragile, yet so wonderfully created and given a chance to experience the beauty of his creation. So how could I ever possibly control what is his sovereignty? God has revealed to me time and time again that to be at peace is to trust in his provision and recognize that Jesus is the only security I will ever need. Coming to that conclusion didn't occur overnight. Through countless periods of my life of feeling unwanted or not measuring up, being quick to judge others, but being afraid of being judged. Uh, I can say that I stand on the other side of those periods because of God's great love for me. There are still times when I'm racked with uncertainty and I struggle to find peace because I can't see the path ahead of me. But that's who God is in those storms of life, a cornerstone for a firm foundation, the one who will never falter no matter how far the waves may toss me. Uncertainty is a virtue of these lives we're living in, but God is working through it all. Um, so in Isaiah 26, verse 3, the Bible says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So I can say that finally I can let go and be at peace. I'm embraced by a God who never wavers. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Well, good morning, JCC. Glad you could join us for our online service this morning. Thank you again for our sister Christine for sharing her testimony with us and sharing what God is doing in her life. Uh, this morning, I want to go to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. And the title of my message this morning is called Persevering Through Difficult Times. Persevering Through Difficult Times. And so I'm going to read these verses for us. I'm going to pray, and then we'll go into the message together. James writes, 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Let me pray for us, and we'll go into the message together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that you've gathered us online to worship you. Uh, Lord, I thank you for our sister Christine for allowing her to share what God is doing in her life. And Lord, I pray for every single member of our church as we're watching this in our living rooms, our kitchens this morning. Lord, I pray that your presence would be so real in our lives. Lord, I know many of us, as we're watching this, we're going through a lot of difficulties in life, whether it be uh, health issues, whether it be uncertainty of the future, whether it be just finishing our academic career or year. Lord, I pray that you would give us a peace that transcends all understanding. And Lord, as we look at this text this morning, give us a proper perspective of how we should look at difficult times, trials, and pain in our life, so that, as James writes, that we would become complete and that we would find joy even in the midst of our trials. Lord, speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, all of us at some point of our lives probably have asked the question, what is the point? What is the point? Or what, what is the purpose of a certain thing in our life? A couple examples I thought about. Some people I've heard say, well, what is the point of joining a gym if I'm just going to quit a few months into my membership? Another person I remember ask, telling me saying, what is the point of making a budget if I'm never going to stick to a budget or if I'm always going to go over my budget? I know a lot of church people, being a pastor, a lot of people also have asked, well, what's the point in joining a church? I'm just going to go to a church, be committed to community, and maybe get hurt or build relationships, and nothing's going to change in my life. And I would guess at some point in our life, we probably ask that same question when it comes to trials or difficulty or suffering. What is the point of pain? What is the point of difficult times? What is the point of suffering, especially for those of us who call ourselves Christian and believers in Jesus Christ? And so this morning, I want to talk about the topic of trials and pain. And as we look at this topic, I just want to, number one, I mentioned a couple things. I think the first thing is simply this, that pain and suffering and difficult times is relevant for everyone. All we have to do is identify with some kind of difficult time in our life and we can identify with what James is talking about. And all of us here, we've experienced some kind of difficulty in life, whether you are a believer or not. I had a conversation with my oldest daughter, who is now in fifth grade this past week, and she was just sharing with me some of the things that she's missing out this year because she's now learning at home because of her school situation. Now she has online education now. And she was sharing with me her disappointment of not being able to go to her fifth grade graduation. She also was sharing with me how sad she was because all fifth graders go to this all uh, class trip at the very end of the year. So that was kind of something they were looking forward to. And she was sharing with me of how disappointed she was not being able to experience these things. And so whether you are a fifth grader, whether you are a graduate, whether you are a young adult, whether you are married with children, all of us here, we've experienced some kind of trial or pain or suffering especially in these times as we're going through this pandemic my guess is that we probably also have similar stories in our life where we're going through some kind of difficulty whether it be in this season of our life or whether it be maybe a couple of days ago a few months ago we've all experienced some kind of pain or trial in our life and i would say this a second thing is that trials they never end in life they never end. I hate to break it to you, but we often have this mentality where if we can get past this one trial, well, maybe then I won't experience any other trial. I remember when I was younger, I used to think, well, if I just moved out of my parents' house, I would experience less stress in my life. Or when we think, you know, when I just, if I just graduate college and become a young adult, then life would be a little bit more trouble free. Or when I get married, that's when all the troubles will end. But I will tell you, in every season of life, there's always difficulty. 
there's always trials. There's always seasons of life where you experience some kind of difficult moment in your life. And so as we talk about this topic, James actually writes a puzzling command. And he says this, he says, in the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of your pain, he says, count it all joy. He has the audacity to say, count it all joy. Now, we need to understand that this is an imperative. This is a command that James gives us in the midst of really the season of difficulty that we may be facing. And so the question we want to ask as we go into this text is how can we experience joy when trials come and circumstances in our life are falling apart? How can we experience this joy that James is talking about when trials come in our life and circumstances in our life are falling apart? Because in reality, that seems very impossible. Oftentimes, we're not even sure how that's supposed to be done. Now, before we actually get into this text, we want to just briefly look at who James was. If you're not familiar with the Bible, James was actually the half-brother of Jesus. And so if if there was one person that could dispute the divinity and the claims of Jesus, it would be James. But James actually writes a letter calling Jesus his Lord and Savior. And James is considered what we call wisdom literature. If you read books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, it's what we call wisdom literature in the Bible. Wisdom literature is simply this. It's taking principles of the Bible and applying them practically in our lives. And so the things that we learn theologically, it's really applying them in our everyday life. And so it's very application-based. It's practical guidance for our life. That's what the book of James is. And so as you read through the book of rest of James, uh, the rest of James, James is very practical in his letter. He just really gets to the point and tells you what you and I should do when it comes to living for God. And so as he talks about trials, he opens it up by just a very short introduction, and he goes right into it and he talks about trials in life. And so we want to talk about trials in three ways. We want to talk about the perspective we should have when it comes to trials, and then we, should, then we want to talk about the petition we should ask for and the promise that Jesus gives in the midst of our trials. And so first we want to talk about the perspective we should have. And so again, I'm going to just read these verses, verse 2 again. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so again, right away, James, as he opens his letter, talks about trials. And so The first thing he talks about is that, number one, the trials are inevitable. They're unavoidable in life. Again, he opens up this letter by saying, when you face trials, not if you face trials. Jesus says the same thing. In John chapter 16, Jesus says, you and I, in this world, we will have trouble. But he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul, in Acts chapter 14, he says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so it is 100%, again, that you and I will face trials. And so we should not be surprised. We should not be surprised when difficult times come in our life, when we find out a bad diagnosis, when we lose our jobs, when we you know, have broken relationships. All these different things should not surprise us in life. And then he goes on, he says that trials are various, meaning that there are different de- various degrees of trials that you and I face. When you think about the audience that James is writing to, James is writing to an audience that many of the Christians here, they were scattered because of persecution. And in this this letter, James is really uh, talking about things like persecution. He's talking about poverty. Later on, he talks about financial problems. Later on, he talks about those who are sick that we should pray for them. He also addresses things like uh, oppression, marginalization, conflict in the church. And I would say a lot of these things that James addresses in his letter are probably very similar to the things you and I face today. We probably face things like, you know, unemployment. We're in a in a a, a place right now where unemployment as is on a record high Uh, financial trouble, sickness. Those of us who are parenting, we face trials there. Loneliness. This is a season where a lot of people are very lonely, struggling with loneliness and being alone. Relationship problems stress caused by foolish decisions that we've made. Some of us were maybe having trials because of we're not really sure what our future holds or our academic career, how it's going to end. And so my point is simply this. 
from small to life-altering trials, James says that we will face all various kinds. And you and I have probably been there. Different trials come in different seasons of our life. And so the question we want to ask is, why would God allow such difficult times to come? Why go through such pain? And I want to say this. James simply says this, that the Christian view of trials is a pathway to maturity. That the Christian view of trials is a pathway to maturity. Trials do not reveal God's absence. If anything, trials reveal God's presence in our life. But as we think about trials and God's presence in our life, what God wants to remind us of is that trials are used for our maturity. And so he goes on, and when he's kind of really look at these verses very specifically, and he says this, he first says to count or to consider, and really what he's saying is to evaluate or to take a mental judgment of your trial. Another way to put it is to rethink or reframe your trial. And so as you're going through difficulty, you say, rethink your trial. And because I think the, the reason why he says this is because you and I, we cannot control our trial, but we can control the response to our trial. Here are some wrong responses that I thought about when we talk, when we talk about trials. We can respond in bitterness. We talked about, we went through the book of Ruth a couple months ago. We talked about this character named Naomi in Ruth chapter one and how she called herself Mara or bitter because of the trials that she faced. And I think that's a wrong response that we can have when it comes to trials. I think another wrong response that we can off, off the fall into is envy. When we fall into difficult times in our life, we often look at other people and wish that we had their life or we wish that we were in their circumstance. We often also fall into the trap of self-pity. Woe is me. How come this is happening to me, which is also a form of pride, focusing on ourselves. We often turn to what we call functional saviors. Oftentimes in difficult situations, we may turn to things like drugs or drinking or sex or entertainment or hobbies or whatever it may be. And we look to functional saviors that will help us through trials. Then I think another wrong response is that we fall into total despair and loss of joy. And James says here that we need to reconsider how we frame our trials because if we do not respond correctly, we often miss out on what trials are meant to do in our lives. Then he goes on and he says, not only count it, count, but he says, count it all joy when you and I face difficulty. Now, this sounds utterly ridiculous, count it all joy, because if we're very honest, and this is sometimes the way I pray, is when we face trials, our joy comes from God removing that trial. Or oftentimes, our joy comes from God delivering us from that trial. But what James says here is that when we go through difficulty, he says, in the midst of our difficult circumstance, he says, count it all joy. Not remove the, move the difficulty, but count it all joy. Right? We're not taught to. Now, we need to kind of think about what James is saying here. James is not saying that we should rejoice in the trial in itself. Right. And so he's not calling us to celebrate when we're, you know, when we have word of a bad health diagnosis or when we lose our job or when we have fractured relationships. He's not talking about in the actual trial to rejoice. But what James is saying is that we can rejoice because our trials are producing something. What we need to understand what James is really saying is that we can ultimately rejoice because our joy is rooted in Christ and not our circumstances. The rest of the world, oftentimes, their source of joy is rooted in how much I achieve, how much I have, who I'm associated with. It's all based on circumstances. You remove those things in your life, oftentimes it's utter despair. But for the Christian, what we need to understand is that our joy is rooted in Christ. We put our faith, our joy in a God that never changes. He is the one that gives us abundant life. And he is the one that will carry us through different trials in our life. And we need to understand this because God wants us to have a divine perspective when it comes to our trials. Here's what I know. When we go through difficult times or trials in our life, someone's always speaking to us or giving us some kind of perspective when it comes to our trials. For example, when you think about the world's counsel when it comes to trials, you read things like or see slogans like, well, just be positive. Right Or don't worry, be happy. I went to the grocery store the other day and 
I saw this woman with a shirt on, and the slogan that she had on her shirt was, when life gives, hands you a lemon, make lemonade. And I kind of understand what, what she's saying here. When life is difficult, make the best out of your situation. But that's all really the world can offer you. Make the best out of your difficult moments. It's, you know, there's no God involved in it. I think another way that we could often have a, uh, a false perspective is having this prosperity gospel perspective, meaning that oftentimes what prosperity gospel theology teaches us is that, well, we must not have enough faith. That is why we are suffering. So we must ask for greater faith, which is a wrong perspective of our trials. There's also just, I think, just bad theology, meaning that, well, if you're going through difficult times, God must be mad at you, or God must be not good, or God must not love you in this season of our life. And so, again, it's so important for us to have a divine perspective when it comes to our trials, because James is saying that the suffering in our life is accomplishing something on our behalf, that the suffering in our life is accomplishing something in our behalf. And he says two things here. First of all, he says it is producing endurance, endurance. He uses his word steadfastness, or another way to put it, it's perseverance. And so what James is saying is that trials are producing persevering faith. Trials are producing persevering, persevering faith, right? It's this idea that when we are steadfast in trials, that's when our faith is gr grows. That's when our faith is rooted or anchored in really who God is. It develops what we call spiritual muscles, right? It often builds character and maturity when we can persevere in difficult times. When I first became a Christian, uh, one of the first things I learned was, learn, I learned how to play the guitar. I was so, you know, so, I was so gung-ho about learning to play the guitar. And so a friend of mine, he was actually really good at guitar. He offered to teach me how to play the guitar. So I would go over to his dorm room almost on a daily basis, and I would just strum along with him. And I remember when I first picked up a guitar and started playing, uh, and any guitar player will tell you this, it, it just kills your fingers because uh, at the tips of your fingers, you need to grow what we call calluses to eventually start playing the guitar. But when you first start playing, what ends up happening is that since you don't have those calluses, it actually really hurts. And so my friend was telling me that when you first play the guitar, that not only will it hurt my ears <laughs> because of how bad it will sound, but it'll also hurt my fingers. But he says, even though it hurts, you need to keep on playing. You need to keep on strumming. You need to keep on practicing because as you do that, that's when the calluses start to form on your fingers. And so I remember I had this guitar that he lent me, this really cheap guitar, and in my room, I would just play for hours, hitting different chords, G, C, D, for hours and hours, even though I felt like my fingers were going to bleed. I just remember looking at my fingers after some of these practice sessions, and I felt like they were going to bleed. But after a while, what happened was it started developing calluses. The pain would go away. It's like cross-country runners learning to increase their, their distance little by little. And as they increase their distance, that's when they get stronger and stronger. And in the same way, what James is saying here is that what trials are supposed to do is supposed to help us endure. It help us, it's supposed to help us to what? Get stronger in our faith, to develop sometimes these calluses so that we can endure this tough skin in our faith so that we can endure when difficulty comes in our life. And I think, again, this is so important. Because I've seen many stories and many people in their lives when difficult times come, when they don't have the proper perspective, when there's a lack of wisdom, they walk away from their faith. And so what James is saying here is very important, that we ought to what endure. One of the purposes of our painful experiences is to what? To endure. So what he's saying is, is this, don't quit. Don't shortchange the process. The thing that we want removed is the thing that God is choosing to use in our life to what? For us to endure. Let perseverance or steadfastness complete its work so that you and I would be complete and mature. How do we become more mature in our faith? It's through trials. There is no other way. We may have a robust theology. We may know a lot of doctrine and you know the word of God. We may pray for hours, but one of the ways that we actually grow in faith 
is through difficult times. Because in those difficult moments, what happens is we often see life's difficulties come together with our theology, and that's when we can persevere, and we have a bigger view of who God is in those moments. Not only endurance, James says, but he says that we also grow in wholeness, or what he says, completeness. We are mature, right? And so the ultimate goal, James says, is that we are made to become perfect, complete, not lacking in anything. And so what James really is addressing here is that suffering completes us, that we don't lack anything when we go through suffering with a proper perspective. Paul says it like this in Romans 5, 3, and 4. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. Again, Paul talks about the same thing, rejoicing in our suffering, and he says this, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And so what suffering does here, what pain does here, is it equips us. Right? Again, maturity doesn't come instantaneously. It, it doesn't just come through this intellectual knowledge or just our commitment to the church, but our maturity comes through what? He says, through the difficult circumstances in life. A couple of ways I think trials mature us. I think the first way that it matures us is that we start to have compassion for others. And what do I mean by that? It's hard to be empathetic or identify with people if you and I have never suffered in our life. When we can identify with other people's suffering, most likely it's because we've endured the same thing. We've gone through the same thing in our life. And so I would say this, some of our trials, God is setting up for our greatest ministry. Some of the difficulties that we're going through, again, uncertainty of life. Maybe you have, you know, experienced the death of a loved one. Maybe you're just, you know, you're just unsure of where God is taking you in life. And I would say some of these moments that you're going through, some of these trials that you're going through, God is setting you up to use that for ministry for later on in your life. Some of your greatest ministry will be through your pain. And I think that's so true. Some of my greatest ministry, it's really because of the pain that I've experienced and my wife has experienced. It's through our pain that we can experience and have compassion for others. I think a second way that it matures, and we've said this before, but it, it grows us in our faith. He says here later on, he says, it's because of the testing of your faith. And so what James is saying is that what trials do is that it exposes the authenticity of our faith. What trials really reveal is how assured our faith really is. Because in those difficult moments, again, it's really showing us where our confidence is. Because if it's not in God, then oftentimes our faith will crumble. And oftentimes we often lose our faith in God in those moments. I love what C.S. Lewis says. You know, I think he puts it the best here. He says this. No, the more interesting thing to God is our willingness to submit and to endure hard times. Just as we all achieve different successes in life, we are all handed different degrees of trials in life. It is not helpful or useful to compare what others are given to endure. Rather, what each need to do is to submit our will, even when it means walking through a dark period of life. What matters is our willingness to endure. I am not one of those who will tell you just to grin and bear it. If you're going through a hard time right now, he says, I know it hurts. I know it's hard. Yet it is worth it to trust him with it. If you do endure and you do submit to him, he will reward you greatly. And I think that's so true. And so again, so as we go and as we finish up this first point, what James is exhorting us to do and encouraging us to do is to have the right perspective. Again, we are in a season where really our nation, the, everyone really in, the, in America, in the world, we're going through one big trial. And I really hope that as believers and as the church of Jesus Christ, that we would have the proper perspective. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, there are consequences to it. Yes, we are losing people uh, because of COVID-19. But if we can have the right perspective of why God is allowing us to go through this, and as we look at the big picture, I guarantee what James says here, that we will grow more complete and filled with joy. Second thing that we want to look at is the petition or what we should ask for in the midst of our difficulty. 
again, we live in a culture where we want to avoid pain, right? None of us, we want to go through pain, right? And so we often try to set up our lives to avoid pain in our, uh, in our lives. And so we fill our, you know, bookshelves with self-help books or whatever, whatnot. But the Christian faith is very different because the Christian faith says that as we go through pain, we ought to ask for something, not avoid it, but to ask for something. And James points out two specific things. He says, number one, he says to ask for wisdom. Ask wisdom for God, right? I want to define wisdom like this. Wisdom is the ability to see current circumstances within a broader context. Or another way to put it, wisdom is the ability to see things the way God sees it. And so here, here's James's logic again. We're going through difficult times. We're going through difficult circumstances. He says, ask for wisdom. Don't ask for God to remove the pain, but in the midst of your difficulty, he says, ask for wisdom. Ask God to give him his perspective, to give him a broader picture of why we're going through difficult uh, circumstances in our life. Because I think that here's the reason why. In the midst of our painful circumstances, we only tend to focus on ourselves, our own circumstances. But what wisdom does is that it gives us a bigger picture. It Again, it's the ability to see things the way God sees it. And if we can see, the thing, see our circumstances the way God sees it, then I would guess that the way that we pray would be very different as well. It wouldn't be so much about God removing our pain, but it would be more of God, teach me what you want to teach me in our pain. Uh, I had two friends in my life who've lost close ones, family members in their life, and the responses to uh, their loss was very different. I had one friend in college who lost a brother to addiction, uh, addiction from drugs. And throughout the years, you know, we kept in touch. Um, he was actually continually very consistent in his faith. He would still serve the church, very active. He actually used his experience of the death of his brother to actually counsel others, to help others grieve, and to especially help people get out of addiction. I also have another friend who lost um, his mom to cancer. And as he was going through this diff very difficult situation, uh, just throughout the years after that experience happened, um, he's no longer involved in the Christian faith. Um, same circumstances, two very different outcomes. And I know that we can kind of talk about these different circumstances and different reasons why this person fell away, this person stayed faithful. But I would say this, I think one definite reason why is because of wisdom. One person had a godly perspective on their trials. They had a different perspective of their trials so that they can help them to see their trials through what? Through the way that God sees it. Knowing our trial or seeing our trials through a big, the bigger picture oftentimes will help us. Because if we do not have a bigger picture of our pain, we often miss out on the purpose. And so in this difficult situation, my prayer is that we would ask for wisdom. Ask God to see our trials to the way that he sees it. I love what the message version of this passage says here. It says this, if you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. He'll get his help. You'll get his help. And he won't be condescending when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believing without a second thought. This is when he when it talks about praying for wisdom. And so here, here's my encouragement for all of us. Again, maybe we're facing this season of, again, just difficult times or painful experiences. James says to ask for wisdom. In those moments, it's saying, God, what do you want to teach me? How am I supposed to grow? What do you want to show me? What do you want to show me about myself, about who you are? What do you want me to learn in the midst of my difficulty? That's what wisdom does. And I pray that as we go through difficult times, whether it be this season or maybe in the future, we would do what James says, to ask for this wisdom that he freely offers us. The second thing James says to ask for is what I call belief and belief. Again, verse 6 through 8, uh, six through eight he says it like this. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all 
of his ways. And so as he talks about wisdom, he also talks about when you pray, we need to really pray that we can believe in the character of God. And so he says this, he says, well, ask without doubt, ask without doubt. Again, James is alluding to this idea of doubting the character of God, right? And so he's saying when we pray, we pray in such a way where we believe in the trustworthiness of God. We believe in the character of God, that God is sovereign and God is good, right? And says, he goes on, he says, well, pray like this because if you pray any other way, it's like, again, we are being tossed by the waves of the sea, right? We kind of believe in God one moment, we believe in the world in another moment, and then he goes on, he says, well, that person is double-minded and unstable. And so it's just, again, alluding to the idea that you actually serve two masters, that you are not focused on the character of God. That's what James is saying here. And so a double-minded person will often ask God for help, but not really believe that God will help. A double-minded person will often ask God to teach us his will, but not be willing to do his will. That's what a double-minded person is. And so what James is saying is that we need to ask for belief or faith in these moments because it's during the times of pain and uh, difficulty that we often lose our faith in the character of God. Isn't that true? We often doubt his goodness. We often doubt his love. We often doubt his faithfulness in our life. And so he's saying, it's so important for us to pray for belief in these times because we need to really trust God in who he says he is. One commentator, Douglas Moo, puts it like this. So the doubter, not possessing an anchor for the soul, does not pray to God with a consistency of sincerity of purpose. Pray to the shifting winds of motive and desire. He wants wisdom from God one day and wisdom from the world the next. That's what a double-minded person is. And so again, as we go through this difficult time in our life, what James is saying is number one, ask for wisdom, ask for belief that you and I will believe in the character of who God is. Then he closes and he says this, well, there's the perspective Then he says, there's the petition of what we should ask for. And he closes us by talking about the promise he has for us in our trials. And this is how I want to end. We didn't read these verses before, but this is how he closes um, the, the section of trials. He says this, blessed, starting at verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love them. And so James first says this. He says, we ought to pray that we would remain steadfast because he says what? We have a heavenly reward awaiting for us. And so again, I think what James is saying is this. As we think about trials in our life, we ought to have a long-term view of trials. Meaning that we are not to look at our trials in this very short perspective, but when he talks about the crown of life, he's really talking about eternity. And so He's saying, when we remain steadfast, we are awaiting what we call, what he calls this crown of life. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew chapter five. He says, blessed are you when others you value you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil and falsely uh, uh, against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. He says this, for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so, James says we are to endure faithfully because we will receive the crown of life. Now, most likely, James is alluding to, um, uh, you know, a Greco-Roman audience where oftentimes when they would be victors in their athletic games, such as the Olympics, there would be some kind of wreath or this crown that we place on their head. And so James is alluding to the same idea that if we can endure through trials in our life, there is this crown of life that gives up us life that what? That awaits us. And so that's what we await. We know that trials in this world, they are not permanent. Revelations remind us of that. When uh, the Apostle John reminds us that one day there will be no more pain, no more tears. One day all of our pain and trials will be gone away according to really what Scripture says. And that's what James is reminding us of. As we look at difficulty in our life, have an eternal perspective. Don't be so short-sighted, but look at the long-term view. There is a crown of life 
that awaits us if we can endure through the trials of our life. And then lastly, he talks about the character of God. He closes off this section by saying this, do not be deceive, deceived, my brothers. He says, every good gift, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And so he closes off the section of trials by again reminding us, hey, let's not be deceived. Our God is a God who gives good gifts to us. Our God is a God who is a father of lights. Again, calling himself a father, right? And so this is so important because again, in moments of difficulty, we can be deceived into what? Really not acknowledging the character of God in our lives. And so again, we can don't be tricked, don't be fooled because it's a reminder that God never changes. His, his, he, there is no variation with God. And that's what the gospel reminds us, that his love never changes for us, even in the midst of our suffering. That's what the cross reminds us of, that when Jesus went on the cross, it reminds us that his grace is sufficient, that his love never changes for us. And so in light of that, James says, let's be faithful and let's endure until the very end. I want to close our time and just really acknowledge that I think we're in very, again, very unprecedented and difficult times. Again, as we are going week to week during this pandemic, um, all of us in some way or another, we're facing some kind of trial. And I would say this, I believe that this is a time where we can see it as an opportunity, an opportunity for us to what? Find joy, to mature, and to be complete in the midst of these difficult circumstances. And I want us to end by, I want to share a prayer with you that I hope that we can pray through in difficult moments of our life. And the prayer goes like this. And we'll, I'm just going to read this and then we'll close the time. Heavenly Father, use this trial until you choose to remove this trial. Give me the wisdom to see what you see and the courage what you are calling me to do. I'm going to read this one more time and then we'll close. Heavenly Father, Use this trial until you choose to remove this trial. Give me the wisdom to see what you see and the courage to do what you're calling me to do. And that's really my prayer for our church, for myself, for the world, as we go through not only this pandemic, but as we're facing our own trials in our life. Again, uncertainty, difficult things in our life. May we see it through God's perspective. May we ask God that through this difficult circumstance that God would use it in our life so that we could be more and much more complete and so that in these difficult moments that we would ask God to give us wisdom, to see that as see it as he sees it and give us the courage to do what he's calling us to do. Let's bow our heads in, in prayer as we close our time together. You know, just before I pray and close our time, I just want to give us just a few seconds just to Think about the character and the goodness of God. And I know all of us, we're facing some kind of trial in our life. I know certainly in my life, there are trials that I'm going through, whether it be big or small. But as we are going through this together as a church, let's think about the goodness of God. Because again, wisdom says to what? Remind ourselves to really see God for who he is, to really believe in his goodness, to really believe that in the difficult circumstances of our life, that God has a purpose for us. And we may feel like, just as I was sharing, that we're playing that guitar and we're kind of hurting our fingers and we just don't understand the point of it. <laughs> Many of us are there. We want to quit. But we don't understand is that God is developing calluses, tough skin, tough faith to go through difficult times in our life. So just for a few seconds, I just want us to meditate on his goodness, his love for us, his grace is sufficient for us, in the mo moments of difficult pain and suffering. Just do that for a few seconds and I'm gonna pray and then we'll close our service together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the words of James that reminds us that our suffering, our pain, our difficult moments are not meaningless but actually they are meaningful. And Lord, I, I pray for every single person that may be listening to this message this morning, 
that you would simply remind us of that. I, I know that as we're watching this, we're going through our own different trials, trials of loneliness, trials of uncertainty, trials of unemployment, maybe even trials of losing a loved one recently. And Lord, in the midst of these trials, remind us that, Lord, you have a purpose for us, that you want us to endure, and that, God, you want us to really be complete, to grow in maturity, to really grow in Christ-likeness. And Lord, we know that only happens not just by a robust theology, but through different trials in our life. And so, Lord, I pray that as we're going through this difficult situation, give us the wisdom to see it as you see it and also to respond and to be willing to do what you're calling us to do. Thank you for our church. Thank you for really all the churches in America in this moment that are continually being faithful in difficult circumstances. May we remain faithful until we see you face to face. We love you, Lord. Give us the grace this week to live really every moment for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you again for joining us this morning. Please join us for our Zoom fellowship, and we'll see you back here next week.
And you came to my rescue and I wanna be where you you